video also on YouTube. Okay. It will be live stream. But Lawrence should wait until we start. Sure, sure, sure. So Lawrence, I see now you wanted to start recording on YouTube. Can you wait until we start? What do you have a do you have a Twitter handle? Myself. Yeah. Nah, I don't. I don't. I'm old fashioned like that. I need to get up with the. Uh, yeah, yeah. Up to nah, scratch with all those things. You save yourself a lot of trouble by staying off of Twitter. Yeah, I used to be on Facebook for a while until I realized how much time you waste on those things. So, um, yeah, yeah, I realized it's got like it has got value, but you know you just got to manage yourself, um, right, and right. your time. All right, well, it's, I'm ready to do whatever. Make sure I got this. Prosper, I do have half an hour, Ham. Sorry? I do have half an hour to talk. Yes, you have yeah. half an hour to talk. And, okay. the, and the Benoit, who is, who is the next uh, speaker, he has also half an hour. So basically, you have the 25 minutes to talk, then maybe five minutes for questions, if possible. Sure. Sure, yeah. sure. No, thank you. Yeah. I just saw one of the uh, automated invites that said 15 minutes. I got a little bit worried, but at least the program was uh, up to date. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have gone way over time. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to start the recording. Yeah, you can start. And Prosper, can I stop my presentation or? No, I, I will introduce you. Let's wait for one more minute. Okay. Yeah, so I think we can start. So thank you all for those who are already present in this session. And uh, this will be a plenary session and we have uh, two speakers. The first speaker is, as you see on the presentation, is Bjorn von der Heiden. And I hope I'm pronouncing it everything properly. Yeah, he's from University of Stranbosch in South Africa. And the, his research is in the area of earth science. And the, he got a PhD at the University of Stranbosch. And he spent, I think, as I read, two years in industry. Then he came back to academia. And now he's a professor at the University of Stranbosch. And his talk will be on a synchronous light, so light applied to African earth sciences. So beyond, you have 30 minutes for the presentation. And you are most welcome. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Prosper. And, and just a, I suppose, correction there. I'm not a, I'm not a professor yet. I'm still a bottom feeder. Oh, uh, so just yeah, a doctor. I'm a bottom professor now. <laughs> <laughs> That's it's 100%. Okay, yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, no. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, and like you say, we'll be talking about the application of synchro synchrotron lights to earth sciences, specifically African earth sciences. Um, and unfortunately, a little bit biased towards economic geology, environmental geochemistry, since this is where I have my strongest background. Um, before, sorry, let me just click. Okay, before getting into the actual synchrotron side of things, I thought it might be worthwhile for those of you in the audience who are not familiar with the earth sciences, just to give a generalist background into what the earth sciences entail. The earth sciences are an umbrella term. Uh, it comprises a number of different subdisciplines, including geology, meteorology, uh, climatology. Uh, a whole array of different subdisciplines that all sort of feed into one another because the Earth system is one single system. That system comprises aspects of the hydrosphere, which includes our water masses, the geosphere, which we include all our rocks and minerals and I suppose soil environments, the atmosphere, as well as the biosphere. And I think Earth Sciences really looks at it as a, a, a um, a interplay between each of those different subsystems and try to understand how the earth system works as a whole. Like I've said before, I will be focusing on this talk specifically on geology and environmental sciences. Uh, and at the end of the lecture or the presentation, I'll give an opportunity for those of you that are from the other subdisciplines to hopefully interact with me via email or via electronic communication such that we can uh, build towards things like the conceptual design report for the, uh, for the uh, African light source. Okay, uh, to just impress upon you the importance of the earth sciences within a context of the African economy, I've brought this figure back from a high school type, uh, you know, lecture setting, where the African economy can be seen as being still highly reliant on what is known as the primary sector. The primary sector comprises things like farming, forestry, fishing, and importantly for us, also mining, right? Um, and of course, earth science underpins the mining endeavors quite significantly, quite directly. It's quite easy to see how there is that linkage. However, to my mind, there is also quite strong linkages between earth sciences and the other three uh, sectors of this primary sector. Um, that is to say that without having a healthy and clean environment, without having healthy, clean soils, waterways, and air masses, the other three sectors, farming, forestry, and fishing cannot up, uh, function optimally and be of as much value to the inhabitants of the African continents. Now, I have said that we're going to focus specifically on mining because mining does play a strong role in the African economies. Um, and this bottom section of the slide here has been lifted from the International Council on Mining and Metals from a 2020 report that surveys the extent to which mining uh, impacts on eco economies globally. And what we really take from this figure is that within the African continents, more so than any of the other continents, uh, mining is seen to be as one of the most strong underpinnings or strong drivers of each country's or of the respective countries' uh, economies. So that in turn is to say that mining is a critically important towards sustaining livelihoods for those people inhabiting these countries and ensuring that the quality of life uh, that is being lived by the, by, 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 by the populace is at its uh, optimum. Okay, mining unfortunately does carry negative connotations often. Um, and I thought that just by way of show of hands quickly, I wanted to see how many people on this uh, call were being uh, entered into the call, dialed into the call using either a computer, just by show of hands, or a smartphone. Okay, I guess it's all of you those to encompass both of them. Um, but, you know, I regard myself as a greenie and, and I'd like to see that the environment gets looked after. But, but why I included this slide was really to, to, to impress upon you that in order for us to have these conferences, in order for us to achieve the standard of living that we're used to, that our society uh, uh, strives towards, it is crucial that we extract mineral and uh, metal resources from the ground. So just the elements that make up a smartphone, given this side of the schematic, uh, a list of different elements that make up a computer chip on that side of the schematic. Um, and I think what it highlights is, is in, as, in as much as we can recycle some of these elements, there is still a need for mining to drive the economy. Okay, many of you will not be familiar with Africa's endowment 
of mineral resources. So the next quick series of slides seeks to introduce you some of the world-class deposits that we have hosted here on the African continent. These include the Witwatersrand Rand Goldfield, which is the single largest gold repository in the world. Um, it's now been superseded by the amount of mining that is taking place in the West African gold fields. And there's also a very important gold producing region known as the Lake Victoria gold fields in Tanzania. Gold, of course, is used in the electronic industries. It's used in jewelry. It's used in uh, a repository for wealth and to a limited extent also in the biomedical fields. Also in Africa, we have the Central African Copper Belt, which hosts the world's largest uh, single occurrence of cobalt and large resources of copper, copper being used in electronics industries, cobalt for battery formation, which is used to store energy. Coal, I was a little bit uh, tentative in including the slide. It's a bit of a bad term given all our uh, emphasis on climate change and reducing climate impacts. But coal burning still does uh, supply a significant amount of thermal power or energy to the populace of Africa. Um, we have several significant deposits, notably in the, the main Karoo Basin, but also in a series of rift structures uh, higher up, right the way up to Tanzania. A second use of coal, of course, is for coke which is used in the seal making process. Manganese also used in the seal making process and we have the world's largest on land supply of manganese in the Kalahari manganese fields. Phosphates, again, the world's largest on land supply of phosphate material is found in Morocco. Phosphate being used for fertilizers, which importantly ensures food supply and food security not for not only Africans, but also for people all over the world. Okay, diamonds limited their use. However, interesting to note that we have the world's largest diamond mega placer system feeding the lower Orange River, as well as the west coast of South Africa and Namibia, where diamonds are used in jewelry, as well as in the abrasives industry because of its hardness. We also do have a series or significant clusters of kimberlite hosted diamonds. Okay, Guinea hosts the world's largest resource of bauxite, which is the, the earth material from which we derive aluminium, and aluminium is used in the aerospace industry, in uh, aluminium foils, tin cans, etc, etc. Um, iron ore, seal making process, several world class reserves there also, sorry I should have updated that figure. Um, and then finally we have the Bushveld Igneous Complex which is the world's largest layered ultramafic uh, intrusion covering an area of on the order of 69,000 kilometers squared, and it hosts the world's largest supply of platinum, the second largest supply of palladium, and the world's largest supply of chromium, vanadium, and andalusite. Importantly, these platinum group elements are used in the catalysis industries, and especially as we, uh, we strive towards hydrogen fuel cells, et cetera, it will be critical that we extract more and more platinum and palladium. So how do we study these uh, mineral endowments that we have here on this African continent? And this is a figure that I've taken from our recent paper in the Journal of African Earth Sciences, um, which in turn was adapted from a paper by Beck et al. in 2016. And it just shows a bit of a hierarchy in terms of the different analytical techniques that can be used to analyze uh, earth science materials. These start off with very rudimentary or routine techniques, relatively cheap, relatively quick techniques that are easily accessible for bulk assays, bulk rock X-ray diffraction, and uh, re relevant optical microscope techniques. And then as you go up the hierarchy, you start to utilize uh, things like scanning electron microscopes, electron microprobe uh, microanalysis, uh, and even X-ray computer tomography if you want to see things in three-dimensional. Uh, what's important to note is that within this hierarchy, synchrotron techniques are really listed as the apex technique or sets of techniques for use in studying earth science uh, materials. And this is because they have several affordances which cannot be achieved using the other more routine or mundane techniques. Um, and as such, I put critical emphasis on uh, an accessibility to these synchrotron techniques. So one of those affordances for uh, synchrotron techniques is shown in the, the part B of the diagram over here, which maps out detection limits of the various techniques versus spatial resolution on the x-axis. And how I like to think about this is that many of you are familiar with scanning electron microscopes, which have very good um, spatial resolutions. However, the detection limits are generally on the order of 0.05 weight percent and upwards. In contrast, something like the laser ablation uh, inductively coupled mass spectrometry has really good detection limits down to the parts per billion scale. However, its spatial resolution is generally not better than 10 to 20 uh, micrometers. 
Uh, if you see this red box over here, what that highlights really is the adaptability of synchrotron techniques to really cover a vast array of detection limits as well as spatial resolutions. And to my mind, this renders it a much more important or much more uh, uh, applicable technique to various settings. Um, and an additional advantage to the synchrotron techniques is you can couple it to other te techniques such as X-ray absorption spectroscopies, which can provide detailed insights into the nature of the uh, environmental samples or geological samples that you're studying. I've spoken a lot about the geology side. I just do want to come back to the fact that, and this, uh, this, this comes through in that paper from which I lifted the last figure, there's also a strong use for synchrotron in the environmental sciences and the environmental sciences are quite intimately linked to the mining sector as well. That is to say that in as much as we have legislation in place that serves to protect the natural environments, it does not mean that we guarantee that we're not gonna have things like oil spills, like tailings, dams, collapses, uh, leakages from incorrectly lined tailings facilities and other forms of emissions such as aerosol, uh, aerosols and combustion and dust derived from mining operations. When each of those occurrences takes place, we are releasing often deleterious in elements or moieties into the environment. And then in order to ensure that the environment is still safe for use for other things like fishing, farming, and forestry, we need to ensure that we have a strong handle on what the uh, speciation, fate, mobility, and ecotoxicology of those moieties might be. And, and these are just some examples of, you know, where we've had some of these mining accidents, such as the oil spill in the Niger Delta in the 1970s, as well as the Mary's Port uh, tailings dam facility collapse, which took place in 1996. So these things do happen. We need to have access to equipment, synchrotron equipment specifically, that enables us to understand the speciation of these phases. So based on that background, what we set out to achieve in our review paper in the Journal of African Earth Sciences was to collate all the different studies that have been conducted on African, specifically, earth science materials in which characterization or studies have taken place using synchrotron X-rays. Okay, um, the table, table over here just summarizes those papers that are published in the field of the geological sciences, as well as in the environmental geochemistry sci sciences. The total number of papers that were evaluated was on the order of 29 studies. Okay, the distribution of where those samples were derived from is given from this map over here, where the purple squares uh, represent the geological samples that have been evaluated. The black diamonds represent geochemical samples, which may be terrestrial, aquatic, or even dust samples that have been evaluated. And all the small dots, uh, blue dots, were a separate part of the paper that dealt with the paleontological samples, which have been studied use, using X-ray synchrotrons and, oh, sorry, synchrotron X-rays. So just on that point, I do urge you to stick around for the next talk by Julian Benoit. He was a co-author on this paper. He's going to be speaking about uh, X-ray synchrotrons and paleontological uh, application. Uh, so to, uh, please do stick around for that as well. Just to run through, through the, um, the applicability of these techniques to the earth system sciences, I'm going to quickly go through four different case studies uh, based in different parts of Africa on different sample sets, different study types, showing you how synchrotrons have been useful towards understanding earth systems on the African continent. The first uh, example I look at is a paper by Barnes et al. in 2016, which evaluates the speciation and distribution of platinum within the monster crystal complex from Gabon. Uh, here, particularly, they used the Australian synchrotron and specifically the X-ray fluorescence microscopy beamline to evaluate the distribution of these platinum group elements uh, within thin section slides. Now, a standard thin section slide is on the order of seven centimeters or five centimeters by two centimeters. It's, it's relatively large for a microanalytical technique. And by utilizing the XFM beamline, which is equipped with a Mayer detector array, they are actually able to analyze a sample like that in a much quicker time period than would be achievable using something like a, a scanning electron microscope and manually moving through your sample slide. Okay, so it's been highly useful towards locating these grains and then thereafter you can study them in more detail using x-ray fluorescence or in this case pixie as well. And, and from that study they were able to determine that the platinum precipitates out of the magma solution um, or crystallizes out when, when saturation was reached, often in the occurrence with arsenic as well. 
Okay, so just take you back to one of those figures that I've shown previously. I think what this study highlights is the usefulness of synchrotron techniques towards uh, combining high spatial resolution mapping um, with good detection limits. Okay, down to tens of parts per billion of platinum. The second study similarly uses the XFM beamline at the Australian synchrotron. However, in this case, they were looking at the distribution and the speciation of rare earth elements in ion absorption clays from a igneous complex in Madagascar or to, from the weathering environment above that igneous complex. Rare earth elements are in, in critically important for a variety of different end uses. One of the notable ones would be the use of neodymium in magnets that are used for wind turbines, which in turn are generating green energy. Um, and so there's a, a big drive towards locating new deposits that fall outside of China, which currently hosts on the order of 95% of all known rare earth elements. So this study used that XFM to understand the textures, morphology, and distribution of rare earth elements within the, the sample matrix, relatively fine-grained clays, uh, heterogeneous clays. And then once those uh, rare earth elements were observed and identified, they could use X-ray absorption near edge structure to actually understand the speciation of that cerium. A study into the speciation of the serum is important because serum is a light rare earth element which holds, hosts less economic value than the heavy rare earth elements. Um, in fact, there's a, a global oversupply of serum. Um, and as such, if the serum is, is found in its four plus oxidation state, it means it's actually not extractable using the common uh, beneficiation strategies for these ion absorption clays, which means that effectively the amount of heavy rare earth elements or the proportion of heavy rare earth elements that come out of this deposit are going to be higher than uh, what would be anticipated if that serum also came out. Okay, again, just highlighting the use of this uh, combination of high spatial resolution or good detection limits, but also by using Zanes, it really hammers on the importance of these specialized synchrotron techniques to give you detailed insights into the chemistry of the natural occurring uh, species and, and small species of them. For case study three, I move across to the geo environmental geochemistry type domain. Um, and in this instance, it's a paper by Mensa in 2020 that looked at the arsenic speciation in tailings material from gold mines in Ghana. These are both active as well as historical gold mines. And from our knowledge of gold mineralizing systems, we understand that gold and arsenic are commonly co-occurring. So where you mine gold, you commonly also do find uh, mineral phases such as arsenopyrite. Um, and so to understand the mineralogy of the, the tailings material, which is fine grained, has been oxidized, has been uh, uh, um, exposed to surface conditions for some time. Uh, these authors utilized X-ray absorption near edge structure spectroscopy to determine the speciation of the arsenic in those tailings. And they found that you had both uh, scorodite as well as arsenopyrite present in the tailings. And I think the, the use of zanes and the use of these uh, speciation type studies um, has critical importance towards understanding the the um, mobility and toxicology of arsenic, which in its ionic form, we find arsenic-3 being more toxic than arsenic-5. Okay, again, specialized affordances. You generally can't do this sort of study into, into valence state and uh, local coordination environments using other techniques. So that's why I included that one. Case study four moves a little bit away from this theme of mining and mining and economy, but uh, it looks at some of the work that I did in my PhD research focused in the Southern Ocean, as well as several river systems on the West Coast of South Africa, in which we utilized X-ray, uh, synchrotron X-rays to evaluate the mineralogy and the chemistry of iron nanoparticles and colloids. So it's size about nine, uh, 12 nanometers in diameter. Okay, so these natural occurring iron rich particles play a critical role, particularly in the ocean uh, marine ecosystems, where iron serves as a micronutrient which simulates uh, biological productivity. By productivity, I mean that is the conversion of CO2 from the atmosphere being utilized by biota to grow and, and generate biomass. Um, and in doing so, they're effectively sucking out CO2 from the atmosphere. It's, a, it's a, known as the biological pump. Um, and that process, because of the concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere having some influence on a global climate, has that tenuous link between it as well. So in order to understand the, the, the coupled uh, AC exchange, CO2 exchange, global climate system, we need to understand the speciation of iron and how bioavailable that might be. 
So this series of studies use synchrotron X-rays on the scanning transmission X-ray microscope for soft X-ray spectroscopy at the Lawrence Berkeley National Labs to understand the speciation of the phases, showing the presence of iron two rich phases as well, well as iron three rich phases as well as mixed valence phases. Um, it also looks at the presence of aluminium within the structure of these iron phases because aluminium has a known effect of, of moderating the sol solubility of the iron, uh, which in turn then affects the dissolution kinetics, thereby affecting the rate at which can be uptaken by, uh, by algae. Uh, and we looked at the role that of organic carbon in stabilizing or interacting with the presence of iron too. So that was a series of studies that was quite, uh, quite interesting to, 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 to go through as a PhD student. Just again, highlighting importances of spatial resolutions for the mapping. I mean, these are 12 millimeters, so 12 nanometer to grains, um, as well as the uh, affordances of, of X-ray synchrotron to really dive into understanding the small scale structural molecular structure of the iron uh, phases that were identified. Okay, so those sort of case studies just give a generous overview of the sort of things that can be done with synchrotrons. Of course, from our overall review of the, of the 29 different studies, we were able to come up with a bit of a wish list in terms of if there was to be, or, or shall I say, when there is to be an African light source, what would be the requirements from the earth sciences community? And I think the first thing there would be to have a hard X-ray beam line. These are pretty standard across uh, geological, sorry, across synchrotrons globally. However, the reasons that we would need it specifically, and certainly from an economic geology perspective, is that these hard X-rays are, are able to um, investigate and interrogate the K edges of many uh, economically important commodities, as well as the L edges for several of these pressure me metals, such as platinum group elements and gold. Okay, we'd also like to see a multi-detector array incorporated there, something like the Mayer detector on the Australian synchrotron. There are several other detector arrays at other, other synchrotrons elsewhere. And I think just from the two case studies that I've shown so far, we really can see how that uh, enhances the ability to characterize both textures and distributions and mineral uh, assemblages in geological samples at high spatial resolution and at excellent detection limits. From the, um, from the environmental geochemistry uh, perspective, I think it's crucial that we have access to soft X-ray spectroscopy beamline. Um, often these environmental samples, we need to understand the, the speciation of moieties in their sort of aqueous phases, in their natural state without high vacuum conditions. Uh, they commonly contain biological uh, fractions or thin films that are uh, subject to beam damage when exposed to high energy uh, X-rays. And as such, we foresee that a, a soft X-ray beam line um, would be highly use useful towards uh, understanding environmental samples. Okay. Associated with that, we'd obviously like to see good spatial and spectral resolutions and that these things can operate under both vacuum and, and uh, low vacuum conditions. Okay, so I rushed those two slides a little bit because I am watching my time and I'd like to leave some time for questions. So I'd like to wrap up with a conclusion slide that draws together some of what I've said, right? I started off by showing that Africa is endowed with an array of world-class deposits throughout. I've also shown that from uh, surveys from professional bodies that Africa is highly reliant on its mineral commodities towards driving the respective economies of the different countries. However, if we look at the global compilation, and this is from my 2020 review paper that I put together for all geology reviews, um, if we look at the global compilation of all work that's been done on or geology samples, and we extract just the uh, African sample subset, we see that only 7% or less than 7% of studies have been conducted on African samples. And that's despite the fact that we have such incredible endowments. So to my mind, that reflects the fact that our, our samples are underrepresented in global literature. I also think that African scientists and the work that is being done in synchrotrons and earth science research is also underrepresented in the scientific literature. And to my mind, the only way to mitigate this would be to develop an African light source. And, and I hope that's something that we can achieve in the, the short to medium term or, or medium to long term. Just in terms of other people's engagement and the audience's engagement, there are a number of interventions that are ongoing and for which we do require inputs from the community. These include the African Light Source Conceptual Design Report. So 
if you're interested in what I've said so far, if you think that your field hasn't been adequately represented by what I've summarized, um, it, I would be most appreciative if you could get, contact, get in contact with me at my email address here, either by uh, sending through a letter of interest or just opening up a line of communication that I can follow up with. Um, and I think linked to this is also the African Strategy for Fundamental and Applied Physics, who are putting together a white paper uh, for setting out the scope of work that needs to be done in the earth sciences amongst other physics uh, subtopics. And again, if you have interest in, in being uh, represented there, please do send letters of interest through to this mailing address over here. Um, with that, I'd like to acknowledge, you know, the African Light Source Conference and steering committees for this opportunity. I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors on that paper in the Journal of African Earth Sciences, from which I've developed this presentation. That's uh, Professor Alekendra Roy, Roy Choudhury, uh, Julian Benoit, and Vincent Fernandez. Um, the African strategy for the role that they play in driving science on the African continent, as well as the funding agencies and XTEC Lab for making this uh, platform available. Um, with that, I thank you for your time and I'll welcome any questions. Yeah, thank you very much for the very nice and the clear presentation. And the, it was nice to see the overview on the earth science, what is going on with respect to, of using a sync control. So now we can take questions from the audience. Uh, anyone who has a question, you, you can raise your hand or if you don't know how to raise your hand, you can also just put on your camera and. Uh, as you hand you can see that they, they give you opportunity to ask a question. So, so far I don't see any hand up. I hate it when that happens. It means the chair has to ask a question. Yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I may start also, yeah. So what is interesting from my side also is how the overview you gave of different minerals in different, say uh, part of Africa and also how they are actually the samples from those countries or those region of Africa, they are underrepresented in the data which are available there. So then the question is, how do you think the African light source is going to play a bigger role in getting actually more representation of those samples? Because also one can imagine uh, if we, one can interest the researchers from even outside Africa or in Africa in picking real samples, then trying to plan an experiment in the existing sea control, that's also another possibility. But on the other hand, how do you see the African resource going to really make a big impact in that respect? Sure. Okay, so I guess two parts of my answer. And the first thing is something that I didn't expound on enough during my presentation. That's perhaps the, the role of understanding these systems uh, in terms of the, the, the core level geology um, and the fundamental geology will certainly help towards developing exploration paradigms for more resources in Africa. Um, however, what I didn't touch on was also that by understanding these ore bodies, we we're able to better understand the beneficiation strategies that can be best applied towards maximizing the value from our ore deposits. Okay, so coming back to your question then about the African light source, I think just the uh, uh, um, exposure going around it, I think the accessibility towards it, um, I think all of those will develop or serve towards developing a critical mass of scientists who start to use these, uh, these facilities. And, and that's really been the purpose of the two papers I put together that reviews this topic, is uh, to bring to the attention of the community what can be done using synchrotrons. Um, and I think that will, you know, we'll see more samples being analyzed and will be thought about not only in the context of exploration paradigms for finding more deposits and understanding the Earth system, but also in terms of downstream beneficiation of our ore resources, which currently are often being shipped off to other countries where they then get beneficiated and turned, turned into sort of final products for sale back to Africa. And, and I think the net effect of that is really a loss of, of value from, from our side. So. Yeah, that, that's what I'd hope to see come from the African light source. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you very much. So any question in the audience? Yeah. Question. So, uh-huh. Okay, I see Betty Trump. Betty Trump would like to ask something. Yeah, no, I just wanted to find out uh, just a point of curiosity. Do you have a 
I guess you have. Have you? Do you have contacts across the the continent? I mean, in people terms who of are collaborating as outside the borders of South Africa. I mean, within the continent, in terms of um, chair. I mean, pushing this um, the earth sciences agenda as far as synchrotron, the use of synchrotrons is concerned. Sure. Um, um, the, the short answer would be not many. Um, there is an individual, uh, Alessandro Traor, who serves on the um, steering committee for the African for the for the Earth Sciences uh, arm of the African Strategy. Uh, he's used he's more from a physics background and and technique development background, um, and he serves alongside me. Um, but other than that, there are not too many researchers from Africa that have utilized synchrotron techniques for earth science studies. And, and I, I hope that that's something that will change going forward. Um, and certainly by these publications, by exposures through presentations such as the one that I've given, I'm hoping that more and more people might uh, become interested and uh, hopefully that can develop into collaboration for me, but, but even for the individual just to advance their science. Okay, yeah. I just well fine no all right I don't yeah I was just thinking that I think there's quite a lot of marketing that needs to be done um, yeah I'm just sure. that's just my own thoughts uh, yeah uh, I don't know how one goes about that but I think if people are more aware about the technique um, and then the opportunities for training and possibly at least senior scientists who different from universities across the continent will I think people will take an interest I just think people are just not aware about about this yeah uh, sure yeah because also in that respect i think we for if sciences uh, there is a, a opportunity also to link with industry easily because with these minerals and so on yeah you can mm -hmm. find many industri industries which are uh, interested in a different type of or specific type of minerals mm -hmm. which can easily support basic science for the purpose of understanding all the characterization of uh, different type of minerals. Yeah. Yeah, so if then there is no more question in the audience, and as I can see, I don't see a, any hand up. So I would like to thank you again, Brian. So we can already clap for you. You can see we virtually now put our claps there to thank you for your very nice presentation. <laughs> And uh, we keep in touch. Thank you very Thanks. much. Thanks, Price, and, and good luck to Gillian. Yeah, good. So our next speaker in this session is uh, Julian Beno. So he's uh, at the University of Wits, Wits in South Africa, in Johannesburg, South Africa. And his research is in paleobiology and neuroscience and evolutionary biology. Uh, and he's now going to try to tell us about evolutionary biology on mammalian brains and single light sources. So, Gillian, it is the floor is yours, and thank you for uh, coming to tell us your exciting uh, project. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prosper. Thank you. Um, can you see my screen correctly? Yes. Uh, see and can you hear me? Yes, we see it. We even see the moving uh, object. Uh, we hope to understand in the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> now, last time I had a uh, technical difficulty. So if anything does not work, uh, please just let me know. Yeah, I'll so try. I think it is, it is clear now. Everything is clear now. OK, perfect. So, so yeah, my name is Julian Benoit. Uh, I am a paleontologist at the University of the Witwatersrand. And today I'm going to present uh, some of the exciting results that we got uh, from uh, synchrotron scanning uh, our our fossils, mm -hmm. uh, and it's I'm uh, I'm presenting what I'm presenting today is a project that we've been conducting with uh, Bruce Rubidge uh, since 2014, and it's still ongoing. So uh, still more exciting stuff to come. So I don't want to overload uh, you with paleontological jargon. Uh, most of you are not uh, are not familiar with uh, paleontology, probably. So uh, just to to let you know a little bit of context, uh, we know that mammals today, so the, the the animals that dominate the ecosystem today, uh, are all descended from something that we would call a reptile. So mammals are descended from reptiles, and we still see that today on the platypus, so that famous 
Australian weirdo uh, that um, that lay eggs. So it lay eggs just like a reptile, but it has a fur. It has hairs, just like mammals. So it mixes both characteristics, which is still the live evidence that mammals are descended from reptilian looking animals. And the, the succession of transformation that led from a reptile-like animal towards a mammal-like animal. So basically a sprawling, uh, long-tailed, scaly animal into a small, agile, and hairy animal um, is extremely well documented in the geological sequence of the Karoo, which you can see an example right here now. Uh, this geological sequence documents with an extreme accuracy every single step of this transformation. Uh, so we have the perfect fossil record here in South Africa to document that transformation. Um, and uh, quite interestingly, in 2011, one of the most influential paper on the neuro neurology of these animals, of the mammal-like reptiles, as, as we call them. So one of the most influential paper stated that uh, mammals, well, the, the ancestor of mammals, uh, our Karoo mammal-like reptiles, had a low resolution olfaction, poor vision, insensitive hearing, coarse tactile sensitivity, and unrefined motor coordination. Uh, so basically, they were extremely primitive uh, in terms of brain and sense organs and behaviors, uh, <laughs> which, which is kind of heartbreaking for us who work on those, uh, on those mammal-like reptiles, because we know that um, from their very rich fossil record that they dominated the ecosystems uh, well before the dinosaurs even existed. So we are talking about a time uh, 70 million years before uh, so we are talking about a time yes that was that started uh, 70 million years before the first dinosaur was even born uh, and and yes the, these mammal like reptiles were really the the ruler of the earth so when we hear that they were primitive of course there is some sense beyond that uh, behind the, this statement there's some scientific sense but uh, we can't help thinking that there was probably more to them than just, uh, you know, a prelude to, mam to, to mammals. They were not just the primitive state before mammals. They were uh, diverse in their own way and derived in their own way. So uh, what we did with Bruce uh, and with other collaborators is uh, CT scanning some, well, a lot of our mammal-like reptiles, particularly the skulls, uh, more than 100 specimens. Uh, we CT scan them at the CT scanning facility that we have here at the University of the Witwatersrand. And we CT scan them also at the European Synchrotron Radiation Facility, which gave absolutely beautiful results uh, that I exemplified the other day. Uh, and I will show you more examples today. So, and thanks to the, the CT scanning, we got access to the internal anatomy of these animals. So here is an example. So you take the specimen, you get it scanned, you manually work all the X-ray sections one by one uh, using that tablet, that vacuum tablet. And using this, you can isolate all the nerves, all the tiny nerves, all the, the sense organs, like the inner ear, the brain, of course, and all those uh, blood vessels can now be isolated and reconstructed in 3D using, uh, using uh, the, those synchrotron and X-ray uh, generated images. So this gave us access uh, to some uh, very specialized behavior and some very specialized sense organs that you find in terapsids that were not known in 2011 where when that uh, paper was that i cited earlier was uh, published so we made some progress on top of that paper that show that actually therapsids were not only a primitive prequel to mammals but were also diverse in their own way so here are some examples so first behavioral complexity so that behavioral complexity is i think best illustrated by uh, that guy called Moscognatus, which is a thick uh, herbivorous animal that lived 260 million years ago, well, 265 million years ago. 
Um, so when you look at the skull uh, using synchrotron scanning, you can see here a thick mass of bone with the brain case in the middle. So this is a simplified drawing of that situation here. So you can see here the tiny brain cavity. These are animals had a relatively small brain, but you can see that this brain cavity is protected by a very thick uh, brain case. So five to 15 millimeters of pure bone protecting the brain. And this is for a simple reason. It's because these animals were fighting each other with their head, uh, just like rams uh, do today. And that is a complex behavior because fighting each other, why, why would animals fight each other like this using their heads uh, to the point that they grow those thick, uh, those thick bones protecting the brain? Uh, the, the main reason is to assert dominance. Who is the boss? <laughs> they want to know who is the boss and they fight with their head. And if there is a boss, it means that there is a hierarchy among those animals. And if there is a hierarchy, it means there is a ranking in the social society. So it means there is a society. So basically, what that thick, that thick uh, brain case tells us is that these animals were fighting uh, because they were social. So just from the thickness of the skull, we can now say that there was some kind of behavioral complexity in these animals because they were social. They were not solitary. They were living in herds. And it doesn't seem very, very extraordinary to us because we know a lot of animals who live in herds today. But at that time, we believe before dinosaur, these animals will be the first on Earth to live in herds. So, so that's the first occurrence of that gregariousness. Um, Another sign also of the fact that they were fighting is that the orientation of the brain and inner ear in their brain case. So basically, we used to imagine that they were holding their head like this, which doesn't say anything. Uh, but when we looked at the brain and the inner ear, we realized that this was anatomically not convenient. The more convenient way to orientate the brain and inner ear for that animal to be efficient, if I must say, um, is to put their head more or more vertically like that. And that is also consistent with animals, you know, bending their head to fight each other. Uh, and this is, as I said, this behavioral comp complexity is very interesting given that these animals, when you look at the graphs here, so the, the graphs represent brain size. So basically the higher that bar chart, the biggest the brain. And here you can see that these animals we are talking about had a relatively small brain, even compared to contemporaneous animals. So a big brain is not a necessary condition to have a society, a, a complex, a complex behavior, a, a kind of a society, if I may say. So here is the picture of the brain compared to a modern mammal. So you can see it is extremely small. Another uh, hint of behavioral complexity, this time in carnivores. So we look at an herbivore. Now we look at a carnivore. You can see it's a carnivore because of its sable-like canine. So this guy invented the saber-toothed cats before, like 200 million, 250 million years before the first saber-toothed cat was even born. And uh, so that guy, you can see the snout, you can see the incisors, the canine here, the molars here. But that guy doesn't only have teeth in its mouth, it also has a tooth in its snout. So right here, you have a magnification here of a tooth that is embedded in the snout. So that guy was bitten. And we know it was bitten when it was alive because there is some cicatricial tissue. So that's the healing bone around the tooth where the animal got bitten. And this tooth belonged to another animal of the same species. So we know that this guy got bitten by an animal of the same species. And we are quite sure it was not a cannibalistic behavior because, uh, because it basically survived the attack. Uh, and uh, the, the only kind of attack where the prey, well, where the bitten survives the bite uh, are statistically uh, the ones that are made for social reason. So we think it's a, it's a, we interpret this 
as social signaling made during a behavior that we call face biting. So basically biting the face. So it's a behavior that we still find in modern mammals. Here, for example, you will see two wolves biting each other's face. And so these big carnivores that lived 250, 250, 260 million years ago already had that behavior. And once again, if they were fighting, it means that they were rules in some type of social interactions. So again, it's a complex behavior for such a, a primitive animal. Uh, now we move to parental care, another type of uh, complex behavior that we could document thanks to synchrotron scanning. So that block here of what looks like a rock uh, looks actually extremely interesting to us paleontologists because this is what you find inside that rock when you get it uh, synchrotron scanned. So here you can see one skull here in orange, another skull here in red and here you have a complete skeleton of a tiny animal here uh, in beige and actually what you are looking at now is an adult animal here and here you have a baby animal of the same species so a possible evidence for parental care basically so you can yeah you can see it unfolding I, I ju i'm just leaving it for the, <laughs> the beauty of the pictures um, so yeah, here is uh, just the adult skull with the complete skeleton of the baby. So you can see the size difference between the two. It's quite striking. Uh, you have the almost complete skeleton of the baby here. And actually, when we looked at that block of rock uh, containing the adult and the baby, we also found another lower jaw. So that's the lower jaw here of this baby that you can see there. And here, that's another fragment of another lower jaw, which means that there was not only one baby, there were two babies with that adult. So parental care plus adult plus two babies. And what's even more interesting in that case is that this adult is actually not a female, it's a male, which means that unlike most mammals today in which the female engages in uh, parental care. Uh, most mammalian species, including humans, um, have the, the female engaging in parental care. This is linked to the fact that females carry the baby in mammals. Uh, but these guys were probably laying eggs. So the mother was not engaging too much of her energy into, um, into carrying the babies because they were not pregnant. They just had to lay eggs. So they were not engaged in terms of physiological energy into parental care. And so males and females could uh, guard uh, the, uh, the babies uh, as much as they wanted, uh, which is also something that we, that we see in modern birds, for example. So birds who lay eggs. Uh, here, and uh, another thing that, that fossil uh, taught us was, Oh, sorry, I have a cell phone problem. <laughs> uh, so another thing that our uh, that fossil told us is that these animals uh, were actually uh, living in burrows. So they were make, they were burrow makers. The, this is a section of a burrow that you can see here, and uh, we were wondering why were they making burrows? Was that for living? Was that for protection? Or was that for uh, for brooding and that fossil basically answered the question these animals were making burrows in order to protect their babies so it was for brooding during the reproductive season uh, now talking about burrowing uh, another behavior um, another behavior that is very well documented in our mammal like reptile is burrowing and it it shows some striking adaptations in the nervous system that we could study using CT scanning and synchrotron scanning. So for example, uh, a group that we call the kistekephalids uh, that show some striking adaptations in their limbs, for example, for burrowing. When we looked at their uh, inner ear, we could see that their inner ear was gradually adapting uh, from a general morphology towards a burrowing morphology. So this is what we see in modern snakes. 
So the burrowing morphology has a very large inflated uh, vestibule, and that's basically an adaptation to hear low frequencies. The bigger the inner ear, the better you hear low frequencies. And when we look at our kistekephalids, our fossils, we find the same trend, a trend from a generalist inner ear that evolves towards in a more inflated morphology of the inner ear, so adaptations to low frequency hearing. So how is that an adaptation to burrowing? It's because underground, the sounds, well, the vibrations that you hear the best are the se seismic vibrations, so which are low frequencies. Um, and this is a representation, a reconstruction of uh, one of those kistekephalid, uh, and uh, it was inspired by the, the African naked, naked mole rat. Uh, as you can see, the, the skin is naked, and the animal is eating on uh, invertebrates using a beak, like a tortoise-like beak, uh, underground. Uh, now, uh, those burrowing animals, they were quite interesting because they were lacking an essential organ. Uh, um, and this organ is called the pineal foramen. So the, the, well, the pineal eye. So the pineal eye is located in the pineal foramen. And when you look at modern species that have a pineal foramen, you find this, an eye, which we call the third eye or pineal eye, that is connected to the brain through the pineal nerve. And that basically acts as a normal eye. So here, for example, you have the tuatara. So the tuatara has two eyes, the normal eyes plus a pineal eye. And what is fascinating is that our mammal-like reptiles uh, display that reptilian feature of a pineal eye. And we know that because they have a pineal foramen. So this pineal foramen is the sign that these animals had two normal eyes here plus a pineal eye. And the pineal eye, we know, is only present in cold-blooded animals, in reptiles. So this is a strong indicator that, uh, that our mammal-like reptiles were, um, were cold-blooded. And we mammals don't have a pineal foramen. Uh, well, you can touch the top of your skull. You will never see a hole for a third eye. We don't have a third eye. And that, uh, that means that we've lost uh, that reptilian third eye and that we evolved one bloodedness. So the presence of a pineal foramen means that you have a third eye and means that, uh, you, have, uh, that you are cold blooded. The absence of a pineal foramen means that you are warm blooded. You don't have a third eye anymore. And this is because the third eye um, see the difference between the light and the dark and basically tells the brain when the reptile must go basking or must go hide away to warm up or to cool down its body temperature. So now when you look through the fossil record of mammal-like reptiles, uh, of South African mammal-like reptiles, that beautiful fossil record that we have, and you uh, monitor the presence or absence of the pineal foramen, what we see is that uh, through time, you go from the oldest to the youngest here, and the oldest always have a pineal foramen. You see frequencies 100%. And then that frequency of 100% goes down 90%, 81%, up to the point some, um, some 250 million years old, uh, sorry, 230, 40 million years ago where the pineal foramen suddenly disappears. So following the evolution of the pineal foramen, we spot there is a point where we can say, OK, the pineal foramen disappears. So maybe this is when the ancestors of mammals, the mammal-like reptiles, turned into warm-blooded animals. And this is very interesting to compare with the evolution of the trigeminal nerve. So the trigeminal nerve is the nerve that goes through your face and innervates the, 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 the area around your mouth. So this is the nerve that innervates the whiskers in, uh, in mammals that have whiskers. So it's called the trigeminal nerve. 
And what is fascinating about that trigemi non-nerve is that using CT scanning or synchrotron scanning, you can reconstruct the trigemi non-nerve of extinct mammal-like reptiles. So you can basically follow again, step by step, how the trigeminal nerve transformed from a reptilian morphology, so innervating scales, into a mammalian morphology when it, when it began innervating whiskers, which is direct evidence for the evolution of hairs. So, and when you look at the evolution of that trigeminal nerve, you go from the most primitive here to the most evolved here, so modern mammals, you see the gradual simplification and transformation of the trigeminal nerve up to the point where it reaches the mammalian condition, the essentially identical to that in modern mammals. And that uh, happens 241 million years ago in a group of mammal-like reptiles that we call the cynodonts. So 241 mil million years ago, we know that uh, our cynodonts, our South African cynodonts, had all the equipment in their face to innervate their whiskers. So they likely had hairs. And 241 million years ago, coincidentally, is also the point where the pineal foramen was lost. Uh, and I say coincidentally, but it's probably not a coincidence because exper experiments in modern mice have shown that the gene that controls the presence of the pineal foramen, which is called MSX2. So that gene, when it works in mammals, there is no pineal foramen when it works normally. But if you knock it out, you basically create a mouse that has a pineal foramen. And the interesting part is also the, the secondary effect of that is that if you knock out that gene, you not only create a mouse that has a, pine, that has a pineal foramen, you also create a mouse that has no hair and that has no mammary gland. So you basically turn your mouse with just one gene, you turn your mouse into, uh, whoops, sorry, into one of our mammal-like reptiles. So you make them not hairy, no mammary glands and a pineal foramen. So that means, that means that at some point in the evolution of mammal-like reptiles, there was a mutation of MSX2 uh, that turned the gene, the gene MSX2 into its modern mammalian version. But before that, it was equivalent to the, the, the MSX2 gene of mutant mice. And this event likely happened 241 years ago. So here, what we managed to do is trace back uh, a mutation in the genome some 240 million years from today, which is quite, uh, <laughs> well, that's qu that was quite unexpected for us. And that was uh, quite, a, quite a big deal for us at that time. Um, and now you may think maybe it's just, uh, you may still think that it's just a coincidence, but actually there is also another thing that this gene does and it enlarges the, the vermis of the cerebellum. So it's a part of your brain that is located at the back of the skull. And this vermis of the cerebellum is larger in mice that express the gene normally than in mice that do not express the gene normally, the mutant mice. And what do you see once again? Cynodonts that lived 240 million years from 241 million years or later have a vermix on their cerebellum, so which is circled here, while the cynodonts that do not um, that, that uh, do not have a pine that do sorry have a pineal foramen that you can see here do not have a vermix. Uh, so that's definite evidence that we have a consistent signal for the evolution of MSX2, which is coincident with the appearance of hairs, which is also coincident with the appearance of warm bloodedness 241 million years ago. So it's all thanks of synchrotron scanning that we could trace that. Uh, so we can conclude now that uh, our cynodonts probably are the primitive, well, our mammal-like reptiles 
likely had a primitive brain. We agree with that. But they also had their own derived behavior and their own, uh, their own derived sense organ. And that mammalness actually evolved millions of years prior the origin of mammals already in our mammal-like reptile. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much, Benoit, for the very nice and clear presentation. It was inspiring. Yeah, so now we have time for two to three questions. So you can maybe uh, stop sharing this. Yeah, good. Then I can see if there is anyone in the audience who have a question for you. So please. Uh, let's see if I have a hand up. So, so far, I don't see a hand up. Maybe I can start to asking uh, before others, maybe they, they, they figure out their questions. So uh, how easy is it for you to find samples for character that you characterize the, the, the samples that you bring to simple draw? How is, do you find samples? And also, how easy do you find kind of similar samples for the purpose of for having a more uh, characterization only different samples to see how consistent is the conclusion you are making? It's not particularly easy, no. <laughs> so so uh, usually what happens is that we, we get our fossil CT scan first to select the best samples to send then to the synchrotron. So it involves a lot of, of try and error, if I may say, because some of our fossils are just full of, um, of metallic nodules. And these metallic nodules are not very, uh, <laughs> they, they are not, there's, there's just too many of them and it creates too much artifacts on the picture. So, so yeah, we, we have to, do, to go through the whole process of try and error with a regular CT scanner to then select the best samples to send to the synchrotron. Um, and, but uh, before that, we have to find those samples in the field. <laughs> and that, that is extremely time consuming. It's the most interesting part for us when we are in the field, but it's also extremely time consuming. <laughs> it can take uh, up. So when we find a fossil, it can take up to two or three years before the fossil is ready to be CT scanned uh, because we have to remove it from the rock completely. Otherwise, we could scan it with all the rock, but uh, you're losing some X-ray power. Uh, because of the surrounding rock. So you still need to remove as much rock as possible before CT scanning anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then the, the last question, maybe I don't see anyone who has a question in the audience. The last question I can ask is, so you, you are of course based now, I think at WITS. Uh, so how do you, do you have other collaborators or people throughout Africa also in different countries in Africa? that you are working together and the, or who does similar, relatively similar stuff you, like you are doing. And of course, like what I asked also in the previous presentation, what do you see as an African resource can contribute in your field or what do you expect? If one was going to ask you a sequel to be placed somewhere in Africa, what would be the requirement for your field to have at that specific sequel that is located in Africa? Well, the main limitation of taking our samples every time to the ESRF or to another synchrotron is really size. Like we, we work with animals that were usually big, like you can imagine dinosaurs, for example. So we work with animals that were usually big. We cannot transport them to Europe that easily. So we, if we would have a, a more local uh, facility, that would be amazing. So, and if that facility could accommodate a large sample for SRCT, that would be amazing. That would be a huge plus uh, for us, like we could scan. So there's just so many uh, big fossils that are waiting for an African license to open. Um, so that would be, uh, yeah, that, that's, I think, would be the main contribution for our field. Also, it would make, um, uh, it would make our life also a lot easier. Like, and we could scan more samples and get more research output also, because that's also a limitation on our research output. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what was your first question? 
Yeah, I think you already touched every, nearly everything. Yeah, so of course the first one I asked about what would the what would the African resource contribute, and also the first one was about if we have collaborators in different countries. In ah, Africa. yeah, the, yeah, the collaborators. Yeah, so uh, African collaborators outside South Africa, we work a lot with uh, Mozambique. Well, I work a lot with Mozambique. Uh, the, the museum at Maputo, and um, I have a colleague, Jonah, who's working with uh, Zimbabwe. Uh, we work also with, but I don't think we've synchrotron anything with them, with Botswana. No, I don't think we did anything with them, but uh, that would be great because they also do uh, yeah. lots of uh, interesting yeah, thank stuff. You, thank you very much for the nice presentation. And of course, we clap for you. You can see our virtual claps for the nice presentation you gave us. <laughs> And you keep in Thank touch. You. Yeah. So I think this concluded this session. We thank all the two speakers, Julien and the Boyon, for the nice presentation. And then this is the end of this plenary session. Now we will go in the track, different tracks for one hour presentation, either EPCCR or FPS or the FLS. Then we meet, we come back here from 16 for the plenary closing ceremony. So thank you very much. So let's see each other in the main session after one hour. So from now 